Ready as will be. Hello, I'm so happy to be talking to you three today. This is excellent. My name is Denise Cooper and I'm the founder of InnerSource Commons. And I am an American who lives in Ireland, but right this minute, I'm in California. Great. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Russ Rutledge. I am the Director of Developer Collaboration at Nike. Been working with Denise and others in the InnerSource Commons for several years. Uh, right now, I am at near the Nike World Headquarters in Oregon on the west coast of the United States. Hello, everyone. This is Daniel. I'm one of the founders of Viteria and a member of the board of directors at the Inner Source Commons. I'm happy to be with all of you here, and I'm broadcasting today from Spain. And hi, everyone. Um, I'm Matt Covey, and I'm from the National Australia Bank uh, in Melbourne. And I'm here very much as a, uh, a champion for Inner Source inside our comp company. Great. And so we're evenly distributed around the world right now. And some of us are closer to sleeping than waking. And um, but, you know, this is how InnerSource is because it's sort of a global phenomenon. So we're talking now about patterns and the value of patterns, our experience of patterns in the InnerSource Commons community. So first, I'm going to talk a little bit about why we have a pattern language or why we're working on one. When I started talking about InnerSource uh, in 2014, I was already talking about the need for a pattern language. And that's because I came through Sun where there were a lot of interest, there was a lot of interest in pattern languages around object oriented languages like Java, but also um, any complex situation that's got lots of potential moving parts, lots of you know potential mitigations for issues. Uh, you're gonna see that not just one answer gets you where you want to go. There's many different potential ways to get to that place. And I saw early on that InnerSource was going to be like that because it's so tied to whatever is going on in the culture that's keeping people from collaborating that um, the solution for me in one company might be different from a solution for Daniel in a different company. And so collecting patterns and talking to people about them as possible mitigations for known issues seemed like the right way to go. So I just sort of put it out there in the universe. And then lucky us, we had people from Bell Labs that were some of the first people that were attracted to InterSource Commons. And they were gung ho to help us understand how you build a pattern language. And they had a lot of expertise. So we spent a long time talking with them, working with them through building patterns. And then we kind of sort of took a break and worked on um, video artifacts instead and did a, you know four trainings together with O'Reilly and, and the InterSource Commons community. And now we're sort of returning to the patterns work and looking if we don't have enough there to be useful to some people. And we know that we do because people are already telling us that they've found use. So um, that's why we're talking about it today in this intro to InterSource. Thanks, Denise, for the introduction. Um, what we'd like to do today is go around um, each of our, uh, our experts here and hear from what particular patterns they've used from the inner source commons or what they've seen used and whether they've seen a particular pattern that's worked well um, for themselves or for teams that they're working with. So, uh, Ross, would you like to take us through uh, a pattern that you've seen and that you've used? Uh, yeah, yeah, I will. And I just want to first echo a little bit about what Denise said about the importance of patterns. Uh, when I hear about people spreading knowledge about inner source in the industry, we talk a lot about uh, principles of collaboration, of openness, uh, which are good and important. What I see is patterns are a, a step more specific than just a general principle. Oftentimes you'll hear a principle, how important it is to have transparent and open and equitable and meritocratic uh, communication uh, and working on projects for InterSource to be successful. And I've seen many times people in the industry say, okay, I get that, that makes sense. Now, what do I actually need to go do uh, in my company in the context that I'm at in order to be successful? And while your company is specific to you, uh, so there's no exact answer. A pattern is a little bit more specific uh, than just a general principle. And I've really seen them be able to accelerate uh, people in applying principles of inner source successfully. So it's also something I'm very excited about 
Uh, like Denise has said, there's patterns there that I found useful. I'm excited to, to work to create more. Uh, now, to answer what you said, uh, Matt, the first pattern uh, that, I, that I selected uh, to talk about uh, from the patterns repository is a pattern called common requirements. Uh, the idea here is something that I've seen a lot in Intersource that's a real barrier for Intersource projects to be adopted broadly is when there's common code in a shared repository that doesn't meet the needs of all the projects and teams that want to use it. Now, something that's really common to do in this case is to ask the projects or teams uh, to bend to use the shared requirements, uh, or there's a fork and uh, the project is then duplicated so that one team can have their set of requirements and another team can have their set of requirements. Both of these are kind of opposite of what we want to do. We really want uh, a common project to serve the needs of all people. You know, that's more successful inner source. What this pattern calls out is strategies of how to draw out common requirements in the shared project, or maybe start up a new project that meets the common parts of both teams' requirements. Uh, and then they can build on the things that are truly unique to them. Uh, while there's some specific strategies of how, of how to do this, uh, the real reason that I love this pattern is it calls out the need uh, for those who are, who are core to the inner source project, for those who understand all use cases, to be intentional, to spend time with those that need to use the inner source project to make sure it meets all their needs. Uh, for me, this pattern is a real antidote for some attempts that I've seen at Intersource which is just to open the, open the floodgates, open the repo, mm -hmm. and kind of hope that the community is able to figure it out. There's a lot of energy in the community, but having uh, some amount of facilitating influence at the center of an inner source project to draw out what are those common requirements instead of leaving it wholly up to contributors is something that I've seen uh, that can help make a project uh, very successful. So I, I love this. Uh, common requirements pattern for that specific reason and then for the principle that it's trying to teach us. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, now Daniel, you've worked uh, with a lot of different teams, um, helping them adopt in the source as well. And um, so you've got a, a lot of experience there to pull upon. Um, what do in the source patterns uh, mean for you? And where, where have you seen them help? Yeah, so um, a bit of context here, my, my background, at least at the Intersource Commons, has been uh, mainly focused on metrics and discussions around metrics and so on. So um, the, the pattern I, I would like to, to discuss uh, today or to bring today to the audience is uh, the maturity model. So um, this, is, this is not about uh, certifying that someone is doing this or that or hire a company because they are following certain, uh, reaching certain maturity when, when they are doing uh, developing software or so. But this is uh, this has been really interesting to to help um, developers or middle managers or, or at the chief level to self-assess where they are specifically in, in the different um, principles, for instance, of, of, of inner source, if we go for discussions of transparency, collaboration, communication, and so on. So uh, perhaps from a broader perspective, patterns has been um, have been really, really useful to help people to structure their minds when focusing and, and and dealing with specific issues within their corporations. Um, and in the case of the maturity model, um, that by the way is, is in the, the inner source uh, commons.org slash patterns that we saw before in one of the URLs. Um, for the maturity model, what, what I've seen is that uh, this helps uh, first developers to to see where they are. So they can even self-assess and say, well, I think that I'm here, right? And then as in any maturity model, we have different levels. So you can say, well, I'm, we are working in some more kind of casual or accidental way of, of doing things. With and, and this means that we are transparent because we, we didn't really want to be transparent, right? We It happened that we had some open mailing list or it happened that we uh, had some centralized place uh, any kind of piece of infrastructure that can be accessible by others, um, and they were they were already doing some things in a in a in certain transparent way. So, with this in mind, uh, we can we can uh, um, define 
all of these levels with all of these uh, several maturity over time and then if we understand where we are right now then we we can lead and help lead the change to where we want to to go in the in the medium term and even in the long term right so this is this is great to to see where we are right now and the maturity model is is, is great to see where we would like to see and how far we are for instance from uh, an ideal situation as we can say i don't know the asf right so yeah. this is the pattern i i love I, yeah i do like the maturity model because it helps us codify some of those um, uh, patterns and it, it builds upon the inner source patterns as well and it, the fact that it gives us common language to work with and it's really really useful yeah. now denise i'm sure you've seen and practiced all the patterns in fact written probably most of them um what would your perhaps favorite or most important one be well I have a personal favorite that I've used in my career throughout my career, but that which is the um, outside in marketing. But I'm not going to talk about that one now. Okay. I'm going to talk about trusted committer because I feel like it's the hardest one for people to grasp why you would why you would set aside some of your best engineering work time to do this other thing, be a trusted committer. It's the thing that I got the most pushback from when I first introduced this idea at um, PayPal. And it was because those engineers got uh, their raises, their bonuses based on their ability to code. So it felt like a demotion to them because they'd not spent any time in the open source world. So they don't understand the honor of being asked to be a trusted committer. They didn't, you know, to them, it just felt like a punishment. So it took us a lot of talking to get that to get them to see what it actually is. So we recommend that 10% um, of a given team be sent conscripted basically to the job of doing trusted committership per sprint. And it can it can be a rolling um, obligation like every sprint a different person can you know be in that chair. If there are 10 people working on the project one of them should be in the trusted committer chair every sprint. So what do they do at, at, while they're waiting for their first um, contribution or their fifth contribution? You know, how do you keep them busy? Ideally, they're some of your most senior engineers. So wouldn't they, their time be better spent writing code? Well, I would submit that no, in fact, one of the main ills of ownership culture is that those people are not encouraged to pass down what they know. In fact, they're all, the system almost encourages them not to share what they know. And there's folklore about that being uh, job security if you never share what you know. But that's really bad for the company. It's really bad for the code base. It's really bad for all the junior engineers trying to find their way. It's, it, it's bad for so many reasons. And so by putting 10% of your engineering resource into trusted committership, what you're really doing is offering yourself an opportunity to institutionalize better practices. So the practice of um, not gatekeeping, but mentoring contributions into the stack is, is an open source practice. We think of a gift of code as a wonderful thing. It's not an obligation. It's not a heavy thing. We're not sad that it happened. We don't feel put out. In fact, we're delighted to have a look and see what this person has given us and to help them make it the best contribution it can be so that it's easy to support within the staff, so that it becomes the gift that it was intended to be. In order to get to that place, you have to take the time of your senior engineers to really help people and mentor them. But you know, there's an easy first win in this. And I didn't think of this one myself. It was the first guy that, that I convinced to do this inside of PayPal. He had, 35 engineers, I was saying put 3.5 engineers on the trusted committership path. He said, okay, I see why, you, why we wanna have those people, but they're not gonna be very busy until we get this engine of contribution going. So tell me, can I send all of the pull requests from my own team through those guys so that they have some time to practice? And I said, yeah, sure, of course you can do that. And then he had this big sigh of relief. And I thought, wow, that's, that was a heavy sigh, what's going on over there? And he said, here's the problem. When we hire engineers, we give them commit access because we hired them to write code. But it's not always a good idea for them to submit code straight into production. 
And we say that we do code review, but the truth is the velocity imperative often gets in the way of that. People rubber stamp each other's code. They give it only a cursory viewing. And then those you know, potential defects that they're not seeing come back to bite us. And I know exactly what my quality number is because the company that we work for, PayPal, is really serious about this and they, it has a monetary value. Every bug, we know what it costs because if it causes the whole system to stop working, we pay the, the merchants, our customers, for that lost opportunity. So there's an actual number associated with it. And my stack is 90% 90 90 of the business flows through my stack. Mm -hmm. So a single, a single quality issue can be catastrophic. But I have no socially acceptable way of enforcing real code review until now. You just gave me one. And so the fact that he he sent his team's code through this structure with the understanding that was so that the trusted committers could get trained in their job, they had an immediate 25% boost in quality just from that one simple thing, which represented real money. And honestly, if nothing else had happened in that experiment for Intersource, that would have been a win. So I feel like there's so many benefits to taking the time to get every single engineer to spend a little bit of time in trusted committership, starting with your most senior people, rotating through your resources, and as junior engineers become more adept, bringing them into it as well. Not everybody's gonna be good at it, but the entire company is gonna benefit from both the intended and unintended benefits of you know, just doing this one simple thing. And so that's why it's my favorite. It's to me, it's the core of what we're trying to get done here. Yeah. I think it touches on a point there, a very important point there, the fact that you can get, we, we talk about having the trusted committers there who are dedicating their time. The fact that we've put, you you know your cost per bug, for instance, you have a financial cost per bug. And particularly when the company is that money will drive so many discussions. And knowing the benefits you, you're seeing from that, it's, it's, yeah, it's immense. I want to, um, sorry, if I can, I just want to draw out one more important uh, mm -hmm. point. And I love where Denise is uh, taking us with this mention of trusted committers. I mean, I'd focus on finding requirements and, and Daniel with the maturity uh, model. And where Denise takes us with trusted committer is realizing that inner source is more than just some of these mechanics that we had talked about with the earlier patterns. It's a mix of some of these mechanics, uh, but also people. How do I connect people together? How do I up level people? And the trusted committer pattern is right at the center of both. And, and that role is so important because it touches on both sides uh, of, of inner source. And some of that came out in what, what Denise uh, had said. And in, in some of our patterns, some of them are almost wholly kind of human focused patterns. Here's patterns of how humans can interact in this new way of, of working. Uh, so I just love Denise that you had picked that to could transition uh, us to, to that side of, of inner source and that side yeah. of patterns. Thank you. And I think yeah, it's, uh, of a lot of these patterns, I said that this in rolling out inner source through a company is very much a combination of uh, technical uh, problems we have to solve and, and human, you know, human uh, kind of problems we have to work with. I mean, personally for myself, I even just very simple things such as having standardized documentation within the repository. Um, when you try this for the first time and you're suddenly realizing you have to work across thousands of repositories, something as simple as standardizing on a readme and a contributing guide and a pull request guide and issue, uh, um, issue templates, something as simple as that can be transformational in a way that it helps it helps people collaborate together. Suddenly things become much more standard. Whereas mm -hmm. if you don't have some of those just simple mechanical rules in place, then it becomes so much harder for somebody to reach over to another team and say, well, how can I help you? And often the real answer will be back, I'm a bit busy. Can you come back next week? But if we standardize just on those aspects, it takes, you know, it, it means that we can, people can learn themselves about how to make that contribution. People can learn themselves and not take each other's productivity yes. down. That's yeah. the important thing. Yeah. And yeah. Daniel, is there anything else that you would like to add on any of the topics we discussed? Oh, yeah. Just to stress the point that uh, patterns or the way we are defining patterns at the inner source commons are really human related centric. Mm -hmm. um, and just to bring your attention to the template that we typically use, so we have uh, some 
problem statement, then we have the context, if this is a large corporation or not, the, the way this is working, geographically distributed and so. Um, then we have uh, like the forces against and in favor of this that are typically human behaviors or people, right? Uh, because processes or so are defined by, by people themselves within the corporation. And then we have like the, the solution and the and the resulting context that we we are going there. So I think it's important to remark these these four or five main areas that mm -hmm. help to structure all of this information. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for your uh, contributions here today. Um, I would encourage everyone here to go look at the inner source patterns and, and read through them. They, I think often when you go to read them through the first time, if, if this is your first time reading them, you'll have a, an epiphany moment somewhere along the way. I know I certainly did when you're reading a pattern, you go, but we already do this thing. We already do this. And then you go, there's that, you find the other patterns, uh, particularly around, you know, how to work within, uh, with, with people. You suddenly get these um, really, really good ideas on how to take you through the, to the next level. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ross. Thank you, Denise. And thank you, Daniel, for your time. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Thanks, Matt, so much. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.